Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. This segment was brought to you by Orem Capital. If you are thinking about exiting or succession with a business today, you are joining a growing number of owners also considering the same alternatives. And if you've already heard that news, then you know exits or successions can be challenging, unless you can facilitate a recipe ahead of time and make your company prominent to attract attention and maximize your enterprise value in the broadest market. Anticipate and facilitate with Aurum Capital Connect today. For more information, please visit aurumcapconnect.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Jim Marty. He's the CEO and founder at Bridge West LLC. Jim, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing in the CPA uh, space is actually really innovative and cool. But maybe before we get into all that stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure, sure. Um, I'm from Hanover, Mass. And um I went to the University of Massachusetts back in the late 70s. That's where I met my wife of all these many years. Wow. And what did, um, what did you take and why in university? I was an accounting major. I always wanted to be a CPA. I always had a lot of um, I, organizational ideas of you know, how to create a business, how to model revenue and expenses. And um, I looked forward to, to doing that after I graduated. So, but was there like a defining moment or, or something that happened in your life that got you passionate about that? No, no, it just always seemed a natural fit for me. Interesting. Okay. So you also got your master's degree. What made you want to do that? Well, that's a good, good story too. So in 1984, um, I started this business that still exists today in one bedroom of our house doing tax returns and small business accounting in Longmont, Colorado. Uh, my wife and I always wanted to live out west, so after college we got married and moved to Longmont, Colorado, where I still am today. What made you and want to move out business, west? Sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. No, that's okay. I guess I always enjoyed westerns and cowboy movies and such and horses. So just wanted to live the Western lifestyle. I did spend a couple of years working for a very buttoned down CPA firm in Boston before moving to Colorado. And that's what uh, I realized, you know, maybe the East Coast was was not for me. I was looking forward to having a more open and Western spirit. Sure. No, makes makes total sense. So keep going through your journey. You started off in your house and, and walk us through your your journey up until Bridge West and, and founding that? Sure, sure. Yes, um, I very quickly um, had several clients and at the suggestion of a, um, a very good CPA consultant, who's a, still a friend of mine, Chris Fredrickson, I um, moved out of my house within six months, rented an office from a law firm in town because at Chris's suggestion, uh, and advice, he said, they will send you business. And that's exactly what happened. I took a office in a, inside of a law firm and they continue to send me business. Uh, the business grew and prospered. I caught the whole 1980s uh, Reagan years boom. And um, by the 1990s, I was up to about 10 people in my CPA firm. Oh, very cool. So, how did Bridge West come to be, and what exactly is it? Okay, well, that's another story. Um, it, you have to back up a little bit and go back to 2002 when the citizens of Colorado voted in a constitutional amendment for medical marijuana to be legal. Okay. And we um, 
didn't really do anything with that. People could grow six plants at home, 12 if you were a couple. And, uh, but nobody opened retail or um, cultivate, large cultivations um, until 2009 when the Obama administration said uh, in a couple of memos from the Justice Department of the Obama administration that they would not uh, interfere with state compliant marijuana businesses. So the summer of 2009, I came back from my vacation and my friends are all excited. Hey, Jim, Jim, you wouldn't believe all that's happened while you were gone. All these dispensaries are opening up and they all need an accountant. Interesting. So I thought about it. I started visiting some of these shops and attending some of the cannabis organizational meetings that were happening in Denver. Um, Some of them emerged as um, the National Cannabis Industry Association, the NCIA, where I met a lot of what I call the cannabis attorneys in Denver. Uh, But still, I wanted to do my own due diligence. So in November of 2009, I flew out to California and I got to meet with some very prominent CPAs and attorneys in the cannabis industry in the Bay Area. And uh, they told me two very important things. They were kind enough to share their knowledge with me. And they said, Jim, the IRS wants you to help these people. And two, we've had medical marijuana in California since 1996. Now, keep in mind, this is November of 2009, so it would have been 15 years. And they said, we have never had a CPA sanction for signing cannabis tax returns. So I came back from that trip, and those gentlemen were – Henry uh, Wykowski and Hank Levy, who are both still good friends of mine, um, and they're both very uh, well known from being in the Harborside tax court case, and which has been still under appeal all these years later. But anyway, I flew back from that trip, November 09, and I told the cannabis attorneys in Denver, I said, all right, I'll do it. I'll sign their tax returns. And then I very quickly had over 100 cannabis clients. Um, So much so that by 2013, 2014, my cannabis business was larger than my traditional practice, where I still had well over 100 non-cannabis clients. So I split my practice. Um, 2015, I merged out everything that was not cannabis to another firm in town who I still have a very good relationship with and consult with them from time to time on traditional clients. And then I put all the cannabis clients under Bridge West. And Bridge West, I believe, is the first state licensed CPA firm in the world devoted to the cannabis industry. And uh, immediately started looking for an upstream merger, which I found. Uh, actually, they found me, I should say. Um, Beckerman, Grafstrom, and Mayer out of Minneapolis, Minnesota found me through the Colorado Society of CPAs because they were looking for a cannabis accountant consultant because they had as a client one of the two medical marijuana license holders in Minnesota. So um, we started working together and one thing led to another and they made a very generous offer to buy into Bridge West. And now it has been oh, is that officially 2017, so four years we've been merged and Bridge West has grown to now we have over 400 marijuana license holders nationwide. We have clients from Hawaii to Maine and Alaska to Florida. Very cool. So walk us through, because obviously I think in a lot of people's eyes, cannabis is still kind of like a taboo kind of thing, but there's a lot of people that are using it obviously for recreation, but there's a lot of people that are really using it or discovering it for medi- for medicine or, or certain treatments. A- and it's become a really legitimate business that state governments, hopefully the federal government, I, I'm Canadian, so in, in Canada it's legal across the country in every province. And they're making a lot of money off tax dollars. And you kind of mentioned it a few minutes ago, but do you want to kind of cover the state and kind of where it's at and and how you see it um, kind of evolve? Is the taboo kind of going away or or what's your thoughts on kind of the industry right now? Yeah, that's a 
very good points that you're making. Um, you know, we just came through a very um, divisive and hard fought presidential campaign. Sure. Uh, also the Senate and the House and cannabis was not an issue at all on either side. And now with the Biden administration, people think we might get some uh, normalization at the federal level. Uh, certainly cannabis has come out as a big time winner under COVID. Uh, the states that have legal either adult use or medical or both um, all saw record sales and as far as dollars and tax collections go. Uh, Colorado was well over two billion. I think we did 2.2 billion in sales. Now, my opinion is nationally as a market that cannabis is about the same as beer, and beer sales in the United States are about 110 billion a year. Wow. Legal cannabis right now is about 30 to 40 billion. Uh, you add the the uh, illicit market to that, and you're right at the same as beer. So I think over the next few years you're going to see um, a legal cannabis market in industry at the $100 billion level. Sure. Well, and I think as it becomes more and more kind of accepted by the average person and it gets into more kind of uh, things to use for medicine or sleeping or uh, the number of things that is used kind of outside of just being recreational, right? That's right. Um, some people like to say that, you know, all cannabis use is for medicinal purposes, whether it's sleep or pain. Doesn't, you don't necessarily have to have your um, doctor's recommendation in many states right now. But uh, another thing to mention about last fall's election is we had, and I might not get all my numbers exactly right, but I believe five states passed. Every, every cannabis initiative that was on the ballot last fall passed, including medical use in Mississippi, adult use in Arizona and Michigan, and um, one of the Dakotas, uh, for the first time ever, passed adult use and medical in the same ballot initiative. Oh, interesting. So how does your services, how are they similar and different to traditional kind of going to your traditional accountant? Is it the same? Is it different? Walk us through that. Sure. No, it's definitely an area of specialization. Uh, many deductions are not allowed because the industry is still looked as uh, illegal in the eyes of the federal government. Right. So you cannot take all your tax deductions, but you can take some. And that's an area of specialization. Uh, because you cannot take all your deductions, you have to run your business very efficiently and make sure you have the right profit margins to be successful. And so everybody thinks, you know, you jump into the marijuana industry and it's a pot of gold. It's actually very, very difficult. Sure. You know, cultivation, you're basically a farmer. Uh, growing indoors, which is always tricky. There can be a lot of issues growing indoors from mold to uh, bugs and pests. Uh, you can have crop failures. At the retail level, you need to be very aware of what your cost to grow or cost to purchase your product is, and then your labor costs, your uh, retail footprint, and um, some, biz, some of our clients are very, very profitable. Others of our clients are not profitable or marginally profitable, so you have to have the exact right formula to be able to be profitable in this industry. Sure. No, no that, that makes a lot of sense. And then specific services that you guys offer that maybe are a little bit different than just your traditional kind of tax return every year as a business or individual, I guess. Oh, yeah. Sure. Well, I guess I would start that part out by saying they're a fairly litigious bunch. They're always suing each other. Partners, you know, they jump into bed together uh, in a business and then a year or two later, they're not getting along. So they have to divide up the business. Sometimes that involves litigation. So we get hired um, to help what I call a business divorce. Um, and we do a lot of business valuations. Um, I personally testify in court three or four times a year uh, as an expert witness. Um, so those are some unique services. Like I said, business valuation, profitability consulting. Uh, there's, there's a lot to it. And I know I might be bragging a little bit, 
but I like to say nobody really knows what we know. We've been through 30 or 40 IRS audits. Uh, we've been through dozens of uh, not just court cases, but arbitration and mitigation and partner disputes. So there's a lot to this industry, and that's that's all we do. So we really do know it, and we're very much aware of new things that come down the pike. Um, right now, there's a lot of talk about a new IRS code section that came in in 2018, 471C. Uh, does that mean that a cannabis business can take all its deductions and not be subject to non-deductible expenses as they have been in the past? You know, that's something we're looking into it. It's kind of a uh, wild card out there right now, uh, but we are uh, looking into that deeply with some of our clients. Interesting. Well, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here. It's such a new industry, right? For even if it's, if even when it, I, I'm assuming that eventually it'll become legal federally in, in, this, in America and, and just hypothetically, like when it does, obviously like things are probably changing quite fast as more and more States uh, legalize it. If it gets legalized federally, then like obviously for you guys, it, it's quite changing, right? And I get that in traditional accounting for non-cannabis cannabis businesses, things change and laws change over, over the years. But I think you're in such a new and upcoming industry that it's changing a lot more than some of the traditional kind of accounting and taxes and, and stuff like that. Is that fair to say or, or walk us through that? Well, it's definitely an area of specialization onto itself. Um, it's it's funny you say that, you know, it's new, it, it's new, but it's old. Uh, sure. <clears throat> I just came back from visiting a client in, in Oregon and, you know, the farmers there have been growing marijuana, basically illicit marijuana for generations, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and so in some aspects, it's a, it's an old business um, that's becoming legal and that's sort of the new nuance to it. But a lot of the farming techniques go back, like I said, decades. Yeah. Interesting. So do you still find, sorry, go ahead. No, I said it is very interesting. Oh, so is it still a little bit of the wild west though, when it comes to uh, like, the laws and the taxes or are they really kind of starting to really get this industry kind of put together properly where you know you can really kind of follow along and because i know in in canada it was it was a mess for a number of years and they've kind of seemed to have fixed it quite a bit and it you know most things are kind of worked out is it is it similar in america or how does that kind of work well, it's definitely evolving. It definitely started as the Wild West because many of the cultivators and people who applied for licenses had been in the industry for many, many years, as I said, sometimes second and third generation. So there is still a Wild West atmosphere to it. However, uh, you do start to see some of the larger players emerging. And I'm talking sales of, you know, when your sales go from two or three million a year, which is a small business by any standard, to $20 million a year, you need a totally different skill set. You know, if you're a founder and maybe you came from the illicit market and yeah, you opened your dispensary and you know marijuana and you can do three or four million dollars a year, you can probably do all that yourself. If you're going to do 20 million or more, you really need a team. You need to start hiring a controller and a CFO and an MBA and you need policies and procedures and human resource expertise. You can, at you know, the $20 million level, you've become a real business. And that's what, that's the trend we see is moving from the, the wild west, if you will, to the MBAs and the Harvard grads. Right. Well, and the other thing too, it seems like some big brands and big companies in, in the beverage space, for example, are looking at developing drinks, you know, whether it's whatever variation of, you know, like pop and or soda and CBD oil or whatever, right? Like there's, they're combining a bunch of these things because obviously those big companies are looking to grow their market share and their valuations as well, right? Because a lot of them report to shareholders. Exactly. No, those are very good points. Um, yeah, InBev, 
and um, Molson Coors and some of the others have all quietly invested in some of the publicly traded cannabis companies on the Canadian Stock Exchange, which is one of my my big concerns of the uh, the new administration in Washington. You know, legalization. Well, what does legalization mean? What do they mean by that? Um, does it mean they accept the current structure? You can't ship cannabis across state lines. You now that that provision there of not being able to ship up across state lines, so every state is a silo. Uh, that really protects the small businesses that have grown up in the cannabis industry for the last 10 years. If you were simply to legalize marijuana, whatever that means, um, there's a darn good possibility that big pharma, big alcohol, and big tobacco would come in and crush the industry as we know it. Again, you look back to the 1960s and 70s, and there was dozens of um, cigarette brands and beer brands, which now you're down to two or three or four major national brands like Budweiser and Marlboro. Um, you know, my concern is that if we have a outright legalization, that's what's going to happen with the marijuana industry. On the other hand, if they, the federal government simply says, well, we're going to just let the states do what they want to do, that pervert preserves the system that we've had since 2009. Interesting. Yeah, I never really thought of it like that, I guess, because my initial thought would be, well, if big corporations come in and get into an industry, sure, it kind of pushes out some of the small guys, but it also changes legislation a lot faster, right? And things seem to move faster. I, I know that's not always the case. But you're right, like it could actually wreck the entire thing. It could be de very disruptive to the industry as we've known it for the last 10 years. Sure. Or I guess there could be a bunch of acquisitions as well if you're looking to start a company in the space. Yes, I think some of the larger players, again, that doing the 10, 20, 30 million dollars a year in revenue are very attractive as acquisition targets. Interesting. So walk us through some of the other things that you see might be happening in the space in kind of 2021 and, and beyond. Do you have any predictions or thoughts? I know we talked about the federal legislation a bit. Can you elaborate on that or anything else you see happening or potentially happening? Well, the future is very hard to predict. Um, it'll be interesting to see what shape the legislation going forward will take. Uh, we're definitely going to see legislation moving through Congress in 2021. Uh, again, what form it will take, we don't really know. One of the most important things, and I believe it's called the MORE Act, M-O-R-E, um, would allow banks to bank this industry. Um, you still have a lot of states. Colorado's not one of them. Colorado has probably a dozen or so banks and credit unions. So mostly every cannabis company in Colorado has a checking account. They don't have lending, they don't have lines of credit, but they do have checking accounts. The MORE Act would normalize banking and allow banks to bank this industry. You know, there's still people who don't have checking accounts and they're doing millions of dollars a year in sales and they have to deal all in cash. They have to do their payroll in cash. They have to pay their bills in cash. They buy their product in cash. And it's not only inefficient, it's very, very dangerous to be running around with a couple hundred thousand dollars in your backpack. Sure. So why do you think, especially if a business is legit and legal in a legalized state, how come the banking industry hasn't caught up or has some states caught up or, or where, where are we at with that? Yeah, that's a, a two part question, uh, two answer question. You know, one is that some banks, Wells Fargo and Chase do a lot of business with the federal government and therefore can't go near in illegal industry. Um, however, you know, your smaller state chartered banks and credit unions, they can if they choose to. There's nothing to prevent them from doing it. The um, banking regulations actually spell out exactly how to bank a, a marijuana company. The issue is you have to be all the way in or not at all. And I don't mind mentioning a name because they're very well known, but uh, you take Safe Harbor, here in Colorado, who probably 
is offering checking accounts to half of the industry in Colorado. And as I said, we had $2 billion of sales last year. Well, they committed to this industry early on, way back in 2013, 2014, 2015. But if a bank is going to be in this industry, they have to develop their own internal compliance department to handle the marijuana industry, to handle that cash that's coming in, to visit the marijuana business, to make sure they're compliant with all the state regulations that they need to vote for the cannabis industry and for the bank to, to bank the cannabis industry. So it's not like the banks are you know, just being uh, prudish or too conservative to take the industry. It's they have to make a very large financial commitment in order to do so. And that's why if you do have a checking account in the cannabis industry, you're probably paying on the order of $5,000 a month just to have a checking account. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, I guess it's obviously more complicated. You need the right skill set and understanding of the industry and kind of banking to understand what you can and can't do. It's not just like set up a bank or set up a branch or hire a couple people. Like it's a lot more involved than just, you know, allowing it in, in a bank or starting a bank. Fair? That's fair. The bank really has to make a commitment to the industry and to its own shareholders and internal compliance department in order to be able to bank the industry. Right, okay. You're always gonna have a lot of cash on the front end because MasterCard and Visa are not on board. Um, now many, many dispensaries take debit cards, but not credit cards. But the point is the um, retail and wholesale uh, marijuana businesses are always gonna be dealing with a lot of cash. Customers are used to paying for their cannabis in, in cash. They uh, they don't maybe want to see a cannabis charge on their debit card statement. So there's a lot of internal controls and accounting work to deal with the cash on the front end. Sure. Well, I know specifically with MasterCard and Visa, they they process payments in, in Canada. So they're at least open to doing it. They just don't do it in America currently. That's right. So it, it's interesting, though. Um, and you're right, I guess like certain people wouldn't want that on their statement. And it's, it's interesting to me that you can have like a liquor store on your visa receipt, but going to a cannabis store is, is offside for some people. And I'm not judging. I'm just, it's interesting how just like the mindset is quite different for, obviously they're different, but it's interesting. The mindset of like alcohol is fine but like a cannabis store is not fine on a visa receipt just because of the stigma around it still. Right. Which I believe is changing and For it's sure. becoming more normalized. But yeah. And as I said, um, cannabis smokers are used to paying for their cannabis in cash before there was legal avenues. Right. So you host a podcast. What's the podcast called and what, what is it about? Oh, well now we're warming up to one of my favorite subjects. Um, it's called the Deadhead Cannabis Show. I was lucky enough to see my first Grateful Dead concert in 1979. That's awesome. Yeah, and I uh, saw my last one in May of 95, just before Jerry passed away. So I was lucky enough to see the Grateful Dead over 40 times. Um, wow. And I've certainly seen a lot of the various reincarnations, uh, Dead and Company with John Mayer and all those. So. Um, you know, the Grateful Dead and cannabis, they kind of go together like peanut butter and jelly, right? Sure. Yep. And so, um, yeah, I'm glad to host the Cannabis uh, Deadhead Cannabis Show. And uh, you can find all the episodes. We're approaching 100 episodes on our website. Yes. And I do, I do that with Larry Mishkin, uh, a great cannabis attorney who works for Hoban Law out of Chicago. And he and I uh, do that, record most Wednesdays. We have a lot of very interesting guests. And we spend about half the show talking about cannabis, just the way you and I have here, Kevin. And the other half of the show, we talk about uh, various concerts we've been to and our guests get, everybody has a Grateful Dead story if they've been to a concert or two. So we encourage our guests to share their Grateful Dead stories with us. And we have a lot of fun with it. Very, very cool. So maybe walk us through some of your past topics or upcoming topics uh, that you, you're covering on the show. Right, right. Well, certainly we talk about each state as it becomes 
uh, legal either for medical or adult use, and we'll walk through the nuance of that, <clears throat> you know, whether it's a, a limited license state or an unlimited license state. Uh, for instance, Colorado in even Massachusetts are unlimited license states. So we talk about what does that mean? Well, what that really boils down to then is zoning. Because uh -huh. even though the state will continue to issue licenses, the, uh, the sites for a cultivation or a retail location are somewhat limited by zoning. You can't be within a thousand feet of a school or a hospital or a rehab. Each state has their own rules and regulations. Right. So, um, and then other states have very limited licenses like Illinois, uh, making those licenses very, very valuable. Like I said, as opposed to Colorado, where if you can find a properly licensed site, you can still get a brand new license just by filling out an application, having a clean record, and um, a check that clears. Okay, so it is still quite different across the country in the states that are legalizing or have legalized just based on where they're kind of at in the process? Is that fair yeah. to say? Yeah, every, every state is very different. For instance, New Jersey, um, which just passed adult use in um, last fall, uh, we're anticipating 4,000 applications for 92 licenses for adult use in New Jersey. It's going to be a mad scramble. So that is something we do at Bridge West is we do help people uh, complete their application, get them turned in, prepare a lot of the financial statement projections that are required, uh, help line them up with uh, armored car companies and other security companies and computer companies and camera companies for all their security. So yeah, there's a lot of pieces to having a cultivation business. Uh, but in the end, you're, you're growing and selling cannabis. So at one level, it's a very simple model. On the other hand, there's a lot of very complicated rules and regulations. Makes sense. But why do you think some states are allowing more licensing licenses and others are not allowing that many? Are they just kind of testing the waters or, or where are we at with that? Yeah, that's a, a interesting point that I don't really have a, a good answer for you. Um, you know, each state that right now regulates cannabis, either adult use or medical, as it sees fit. And each state is very, very different. Uh, take Louisiana, for example. Uh, they have a very good medical program, but no smokable flower, just um, vape pens, basically. Very similar in, in Minnesota as well. And then all the marijuana in um, Louisiana is grown at two universities uh, oh, with, uh, and the university partners with a cultivation company uh, to grow cannabis on, on the campus in greenhouses. So that's just an example of how different each state is. Go over to California. Well, California is still a majority of the marijuana sales in California are still illicit because the taxes are so high for basically 40 percent so your ten dollar joint costs you fourteen dollars that it still leaves an opening for the illicit market over there so that's a, you're making a great point great question the answer is yes every state is very different each state's uh, legislature governor regulators have very different ideas on how they want to see the marijuana programs in their state and some work better than others um, Illinois has been very, very difficult. Um, you have pretty good setup for cultivation, but the retail spots just have not been able to get open and licensed, again, leading to more illicit market sales in Illinois. Um, go over to Oklahoma, where, again, there's unlimited licenses there, and they were so quick. I mean, you could submit an application in Oklahoma. You had your license in two weeks. So today there's literally hundreds of cannabis cultivation and retail shops in Oklahoma, which has a very small population. So we expect to see overproduction at some point in Oklahoma as all these cultivators come online. Right. No, that, that makes sense. So I guess the best advice you'd give to somebody is if you're looking to start uh, into the cannabis space in your state, really do your homework and see the pros and cons <clears throat> and how complicated or simple it can be throughout the whole process. Yes. 
Yeah, like I said, if you're looking at starting a cannabis business, um, I'll tell my clients, especially if they're on the younger side, under age 40, I'll say, you know, why don't you get a job as a cultivator or working in a retail shop and, and learn the ropes firsthand as an employee and before you invest your fortune or your parents' fortune in a fairly risky industry. You can fail in this business. It's not an automatic. So get experience, you know, work in the industry, study the industry, start small maybe, and then you know, build, build up your investment portfolio in, you know, before you go plunking a million dollars into a cannabis business. So that's, that's my advice is you know, really learn the ropes from the inside out. Well, I think that's really good business advice for any industry, right? Like if you don't, you, sure, you can be successful, but you are going to make it a lot harder on yourself if you if you don't know the industry you're in or or the business you're getting into and you can lose a lot of money. Yes. You know, 11 years ago, when this all started uh, in most states, you could um, come from the illicit market and maybe you don't have a lot of business skills other than you've got a lot of very savvy street skills. You know, 10, 11 years ago, that could work for you. Today, where the barriers to entry are in the millions of dollars, again, as I said earlier in this interview, we're really moving to more the, um, from the entrepreneur phase to the business school phase, to the MBAs, and you're see, having a CFO and a CEO and a board of directors and, and running it like a real business and not just by the seat of your pants. Sure. No, I think that's actually really good advice, right? Because anything that can be used kind of recreational, I think sometimes people don't take it as serious as like, no, you're like a real business, which I think sometimes it's just like people talk about it. You're like, yeah, but it's like a business. Like it's, I, I still like I've had, you know, I've known friends or other people that have, have tried to get in the space and they don't really treat it like a business. And you're like, well, then it, you're probably not going to be successful. Like it's just a, it's an interesting industry. And, and maybe that's just true of a lot of new industries, but I find in, in this space based on, you know, no data and my personal opinion from some of the people that I've known that have tried to get in it, some have been successful, some have failed. And, and the ones that have failed are the ones that didn't go in it with a business kind of mindset. Yes. Well, there's a lot of moving parts, uh, why some people succeed and why, some people fail, but I do agree with your point that you really have to have a business attitude and that you're not here just to have fun and smoke a lot of marijuana and expect to make a lot of money. Sure. No, I think that's, that's really good advice. So anything else that you want to mention that you have found throughout all your years in the space that either you want to maybe demystify a little bit or, or recommend to people that they should try, try or do, or any thoughts around the space? Well, as we've been talking the last few minutes, you know, starting small, learning the ropes, uh, getting out there. Um, I, re I really do see the trend happening right before our eyes. I would say that basically nobody cares about marijuana anymore. Um, it is, does still have, carry some stigma, but not nearly what it did, you know, when this all started, you know, 10, 15, or in California's case, 20 some years ago. So I see the stigma fading away, especially as more and more people provide their testimonials on how it maybe helped their son or daughter with epilepsy or other childhood diseases and uh, for pain relief for aging baby boomers like myself, uh, helping people sleep, getting away from opioids. I think those are really the, the big picture that's coming down the road that marijuana becomes more normalized uh, and gets people away from the, the stronger pharmaceutical drugs. No, I think that makes a lot of sense, but we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and uh, Bridge West and any other things you want to mention? That's great. Yes, Kevin. Thank you very much. Um, Bridge West has a very nice website, um, Bridge West LLC, CPAs and consultants to the cannabis industry. Uh, we're very easy to find. We do a lot of social media. We do a lot of blogs. Our website has a lot of good articles that we've written over the years on it. 
Uh, you can find a lot of good background information on how to get into the cannabis industry and what's involved. And we also um, write app help write applications for new cannabis businesses. So we'd love to have your business. And uh, Kevin, thank you for the opportunity for sharing my ideas with, with you. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show. And I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. All right. Thank you very much, Kevin. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.